Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Paley Glendale, Dr. X17, and Dustin Campbell. Coming up on DTNS, is this the end for DSLR cameras? Textbook publishers toy with NFTs, and the future of gaming seems to be subscriptions. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 3rd, 2022. It's not July, it's August. <laughs> August 3rd, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Math is hard, Tom. In <laughs> Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah so's Lane. So's reading. It's in Salt Lake City. I'm Scott Johnson. <laughs> and I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Yes. Shall we start with a few tech things you should know? Yes, we should. Yes. Thank you. Twitter is sending out subpoenas uh, to Elon Musk's financial partners as part of its suit against Musk for backing out of the $44 billion deal to acquire Twitter. The company was granted a fast track five day trial set to begin in October, October 17th to be exact. Musk's team had sought to put off the trial until early next year. But Chancellor Kathleen McCormick, the head judge of Delaware's Court of Chancery, said, quote, delay threatens Ipper irreparable harm, the longer the delay, the greater the risk, end quote. Musk maintains that Twitter failed to provide enough information about bots on the platform, and the company breached obligations by firing managers and laying off workers. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports that, according to people with knowledge of the matter... <laughs> Apple expects to delay its next major iPad OS software update, but just by about a month. Uh, so that would mean not releasing it at the same time as a new iPhone update, as the company has done in years past. In Google Stadia news, 9 to 5 Google uh, confirmed that the, the company removed the Stadia room from the company's New York retail store, Google's first retail store for in-person purchases, advice, demos, and repairs. It was an Apple store for Google things. The Stadia room was replaced by a new room called the Pixel Buds Pro Experience. <laughs> Where's my Stadia yeah. room? Just listen to these earbuds. They're great. Buy them. <laughs> Apple Care Plus theft and loss coverage is now available if you live near the Mediterranean. France, Italy, and Spain used to only get accidental damage coverage, but now they get theft and loss as well. Both versions of Apple Care Plus have deductibles they have to pay before making a claim. Claims are limited to two per year. Standard Apple Care Plus costs depend on the phone version. Costs range from €4.99 Euros a month to €11.49 Euros a month. And Apple Care Plus with theft and loss is more expensive, as you might expect. €7.49 Euros a month, up to €14.49 Euros a month max. OnePlus announced its newest device, the OnePlus 10T, only four months after launching the OnePlus 10. Now, the 10T goes for $649. That's $250 cheaper than the $899 OnePlus 10 Pro. However, Engadget notes that the 10T is slightly faster than OnePlus 10 Pro because it has a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 system on a chip. OnePlus's latest offering starts at 8 gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage, with a new 16 gig, 256 gig tier for $100 more. So you have some options there. Other specs include an in-screen fingerprint reader, a USB-C port, but also a smaller battery and no wireless charging option, which will make some people not thrilled. All right. Scott Johnson loves to talk about NFTs. We can't stop him. Scott, yes. what are you talking about today? The NFT well, can go. in my effort to never stop <laughs> spewing information about NFTs, I'd like to tell you the following. <laughs> Book publisher Pearson's CEO Andy Bird told reporters that he believes NFTs could help the company add revenue from the resale of digital textbooks. As you know now, if you have a textbook in school, you sell to somebody, they don't get any of that. Theoretically, a textbook sold as an NFT would allow for the electronic version of the textbook to be resold after a student is done using it, something that isn't allowed now for uh, electronic textbooks. The NFT could also be configured to detect a portion of the, or excuse me, direct a portion of the sale price back to Pearson, the publisher, uh, something that cannot be done with the resale of physical textbooks or current PDFs. The Verge argues that Pearson is likely to still use DRM on all of its eBooks, uh, which would make the use of NFT almost unnecessary since a resale system could be used with existing DRM. Uh, and it's worth remembering that Bird is not only speculating on the idea, uh, floating it in public, if you will, he didn't announce any kind of NFT plan for Pearson. So this isn't official, uh, but they are talking about it. 
Listen, I so when I was thinking about this earlier, because I'm I'm unlike Scott, who loves everything NFT, uh, you know, most NFT things, I'm like, eh, I don't want to buy a board ape today. But when it comes to something like, okay, let's say I buy a math textbook, it's required for my class, it costs me $45 or whatever. And yeah, I can resell that for a loss. Um, maybe I bought it al already used. So that person that sold it to me was at a loss, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. That has been how student textbooks have gone for some time. If you're a starving student, you might say, well, why are we, you know, giving money back to Pearson? That sucks for them. But I think it's genius. I really do. Pearson's mm. like, we made the book. If yeah. the book, if the book is going to live, you know, with many people over a period of years after we made the book for you to make you a smarter person, I don't blame them for trying to get a kickback for it because well, also, they can follow who bought, bought the book. Also, this this sort of represents a use case for the technology that's that's apart from all of the, the freak out. I noticed today when I first heard this story uh, on Twitter in particular, people were freaking out because the word NFT inspires a lot of anger and pushback and everything. But but to me, this is one of those leg legitimate use cases. Not that there are others that aren't legitimate. But my point is, like, this is a technicality that fits well within this uh, need, right? And if you're a publisher of content, no matter what it is, I think these are just, you know, these are just one example, but other publishers might take note of this. The idea that you could create that revenue stream longer term, and maybe even, I'm not sure they'll do this, but make the initial purchase less because you know in the long tail you're going to get more money. Uh, mm -hmm. these, these all seem like good machinations to me. They don't, this doesn't feel like, ah, the, the crypto bros are back and they're trying to figure out another way into your wallet. I don't think it's, well, that's what this is. I don't either. I feel like it's like, this is like a very, uh, you know, making textbooks for, uh, college or, you know, it, you know, for education in general, we've been doing this a long time. Why so haven't to, they done it before now? Well, like, you don't well, need NFTs don't to do this. You have a yeah. digital rights management platform. You've even got a subscription platform for textbooks. Uh, why not just offer this? Why go out in your earnings call and float the language of NFT without a plan? That's my question. That's I don't, a fair I, point. I'm not saying either one of you are wrong in anything you've said. Right. I'm just right, right. a little suspicious uh, you, if they're really into doing this, why they haven't done it. Do you think it would be like if you're trying to build, I was thinking about this comparison today, if you were trying to build, let's say, um, an audience support system and you had to build everything in the back end for people to support something you're doing, a, t a show or a podcast even, mm -hmm. or do you do the thing that's already got a lot of automation triggers built into it? Is it, like is it cheaper to Patreon. roll it out is basically what you're saying. Kind of what I'm saying. And manage yep. it in the long haul. Like, is it going to be a thing where because it's the ledger and because it's the all-knowing uh, blockchain forever and always, that there'll be systems in line that will just always be there for you to track your stuff, whereas any other thing, you'd have to do it all. You'd have to manage I, I that think, whole thing. I think there could be a world world where Pearson's Andy Bird came out and said all those things and said, ah, we are partnering with these platforms that are very experienced in doing this and take advantage of the efficiencies of the blockchain and NFTs. And we're going to provide the ability for you to resell your textbooks, uh, but also get constant updates. So your textbook will always be the latest edition, uh, no matter which when you bought it. Uh, it's it's going to do all these great things. And here's the benefit of the NFT. But that's not what he did. He went on the earnings call and went, Man, NFTs, huh? Uh, those are cool. You know, maybe yeah. we should do that with textbooks. Well, that'd be fun, right? Yeah, we did do it a bit. Uh, we well, gave it a better I mean, description than he did, for sure. That's where the yeah. conversation, like, we're all having a conversation about, like, well, is this good? Is this bad? It's certainly <laughs> advantageous for a company like Pearson. But as you're saying, Tom, it's like, it was a bit of a throwaway, like, you know, NFTs might be a future for us. Might be real good for us. We uh, don't let's know. See, let's see what people who read Bloomberg yeah. think. Yeah. I yeah. A smart person told me recently I can make more money from NFTs. So, yeah. you know. My, it always comes out of the guy who's happen. got, it's always comes out of the guy who's got multiple couches in his office. And I'm telling you, when you've got that what? kind of, when you're the CEO and you've got couches and extra computers and you're the fancy man upstairs. You tend to just go, yeah, we were talking about this the other day. And he's not really thinking about describing it. So I'm with you, I'm with you, Tom, on this that entirely, by the way. And I agree, he could have messaged us so much better, especially given the climate around NFTs. This would have been the time to be very verbose about what your plan was or wasn't. And 
He missed it. Well, camera people out there, you know who you are. Uh, it's not all about smartphone cameras, but you may have heard DSLRs could be on the way out. Is that true? Not exactly true. But there is a big change going on in the camera industry, and Rich Truffolino and our own Amos are here with the lowdown. <laughs> Well, Amos, if you heard a wailing and gnashing of teeth from a photographer friend of yours, there is good reason, kind of big news in the world of photography uh, over the last couple of weeks here. It's it's pretty big. Nikkei Asia reported that Nikon will stop developing single lens reflex cameras altogether, DSLRs as they're known in the biz. Nikon had previously said they would not develop another flagship after their D6 camera, which is their big professional body. This is the things you would uh, uh, shoot the Super Bowl with or something like that. But this announcement now means no new DSLRs seem to be coming at all. If you thought right. Nikon might have already been out of that market, you'd have good reason. The D6 came out in June 2020, which in tech terms is like a thousand years old. In camera terms, it's not that bad, but it's it's been a while. Mm -hmm. um, now, the important thing to note here, Nikon has not confirmed this report. They've not said they're stopping it, They but they didn't deny it either. And they did say they will continue to produce, distribute, and support existing DSLR models. But I've already told investors they plan to wind down the business by 2025 anyway. So, you know, we may be debating about angels on the head of a pin here. Uh, don't worry, though. You can still go to Target and find your, your entry level uh, Nikon DSLR. It has not disappeared from store shelves as of yet. For some context, though, Nikon first started producing uh, film SLRs back in 1959. I think it's important to set this up if you're if you haven't been following the camera market recently. Uh, since the the early 2010s, there has been an increasing number of so-called mirrorless cameras. I'm old enough to remember when we didn't even know what the term we were going to do. We were like ILCs, interchangeable lens cameras. Mm -hmm. We didn't kind of quite know. Basically, the difference is with a DSLR, you have a mirror kind of in the middle of your camera. You're looking through the lens, uh, but it's going, it's hitting a mirror, bouncing up to a prism, and then heading into your eye. A mirrorless camera is just reading the sensor directly yep. through the lens. You're still viewing through the lens, but there's no intermediary there. Right. And and one of the big things that you have to understand about that is that if you have a mirror that is redirecting light from the lens into a prism to go into your eyes so you can frame it and find your focus, all that kind of stuff, when you actually go to hit the shutter, that mirror has to flip up out of the way. So you have a physical action that has to take place in order for the light to go through the lens and hit the sensor, which is hiding behind the mirror. So it, it's more physically complicated, but for a long time, they didn't have uh, necessarily the hardware capability to not only have the sensor watching what's coming through the mirror, but also feed it to you in your eye in a way that was useful without an, so much lag that you couldn't properly frame a shot. Yeah, because basically a mirrorless camera, like what you're viewing, a lot of them have viewfinders that look like, you know, a DSLR, you're holding them up to your eye, but that is just a really tiny display that they're magnifying on. And right. so for, especially in the early days, I had an early Olympus EPL-1 uh, camera. So you're, it's all screen-based, right? So you're dependent on not just resolution, very important for determining like critical focus and that kind of stuff, but also input lag, right? So you were dealing with you know, 2010s display technology, slower refresh rates, not great resolution, especially yep. when you're magnifying that on like a one inch, uh, you know, display. And then lots of potential input lag, especially if you're it, you know, not necessarily that bad if you're shooting a portrait, if you're shooting sports or, or that kind of stuff can get uh, to be a big problem. So for a long time, these were kind of relegated to more enthusiast cameras just out of technical limitations. Yeah, in fact, uh, the first time Canon dipped its toe into the mirrorless market was with the, I believe, the M50 just mm, yes. about 10 years ago um, in July. So that was their first dip into it, and that was with a smaller sensor. It was with a, a camera that was designed with fewer features, so they could concentrate on providing that lower latency display for you to frame and take your shots. Sony had already been in the, in, in that, that waters. Nikon hadn't quite got there yet, but... That was kind of like the the big impetus into hey let's let's try this out. So it's only taken ten years, and I gotta say, within ten years, mirrorless has basically killed the DSLR market. Well, and and for me, really, it's video, right? Like the the emergence of like every photographer now is basically a hybrid video shooter, and the issue with 
a DSLR is like you said, you have that mirror that's literally in front of the sensor. You're mm -hmm. never at any point when you're using a DSLR, if you're looking through the viewfinder, you're not seeing what's on the sensor. To do that, you actually have to flip up the mirror. You lose one of the primary benefits of a DSLR so that you can use live view mode to do a, to read off of the back screen. Yeah. Um, and it, and it, that requires also you, you then you need two different ways of focusing the two different focusing systems on the camera. You need two different exposure systems on the camera. Yeah. So if you're doing video for any appreciable amount of time on one of these cameras, it provided you have good displays, which we now uh, you know have in abundance. Uh, it, it's a lot easier to just go with a mirrorless camera. And hence why we're seeing everyone but Pentax kind of going uh, mirrorless. This is my first DSLR. It is a uh, EOS Rebel T1i. And I could either look through the viewfinder or see the image on the back screen. And I never used it for video because I had to use the image on the back screen. And the lag was awful. The capability of the camera itself was awful. So going to a mirrorless format for me seemed like a no-brainer. And I almost went with uh, the M50, M60, one of those lines. But they used a different lens set, so I wasn't ready to make that jump quite yet. But now that the, the R series has come out, I jumped immediately. I was hooked. I knew exactly what the capabilities were going to be. And not only do you not have the physical shutter that, uh, or the physical mirror that has to flip up for the shutter to actuate in the sensor to gather the light, but th you don't have that space commitment for the mirror. And that allows you to build everything in the camera just a little bit more spaced out for heat dissipation or for putting more components in there, adding buffer size, all that other stuff can all fit in there now because you have that space that you can now, you know, not only bring the the, the sensor closer to the glass to just give you a better focal uh, 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 truth, you know, that, that, that consistency, but you can also rebuild the entire internals of the camera around that one system instead of having to have two different systems. You can still get DSLRs today. They are not like going off shelves today. Like I said, companies like Rico Pentax still committing to DSLRs, but it seems like mirrorless is the way of the future uh, when it comes to, you know, your professional uh, high-end interchangeable lens cameras. Yep. Back to you guys. Thank you, Rich and Amos, uh, for that. Uh, that was a little bit of an experiment to have those guys uh, talk about this in, in, in sort of an evergreen way. If you like experiments, next week is your week. All next week is DTNS Experiment Week. We're swapping out normal DTNS shows and trying out some new ideas. Last year, we launched shows like Barbecue and Tech and The Tech John. Uh, they started on Experiment Week and, and now are their own shows going strong. This year, Rob Dunwood and Rod Simmons are teaming up to give us a reaction show to Samsung's upcoming Fold announcements. Nicole Lee is going to have a tech culture show from an Asian American perspective. It all starts next week, Monday, August 8th, on the DTNS feeds. NPD Group estimates that spending on video games fell $1.78 billion last quarter, down 13% on the year. Y'all just aren't spending the money on video games like you used to. Mobile content suffered the most. Uh, the quarterly decline fell 20, 12% on the year. Hardware and accessories declined 1% and 11% respectively. If you've been following the corporate earnings reports, you probably saw some of this coming, right, Sarah? Indeed. Sony reported sales of the PS5 rose 4% on the year, which is far from booming, and game software sales fell 26%. Sony expects the market to continue to slow and revise its annual profit forecast down 16%. Okay, so that's Sony. Microsoft did not fare any better, however. Xbox hardware revenue fell 11% on the year. Xbox content and service revenue fell 6%, and overall gaming revenue dropped 7%. Nintendo also reported Wednesday that Switch sales fell 23% last quarter. Nintendo's software sales also fell 8.6%. Why the drop? Yeah, so there were a few reasons that the company's game for the shortfall. Uh, Sony and Nintendo both cited supply chain issues. Both said they believe those supply chain issues will go away by autumn. 
Sony and Microsoft both cited reduced numbers of people playing games. Uh, in fact, Sony even went so far as to cite a 3% drop in monthly active users on the PlayStation Network. That's that's where people are getting in touch with each other to play games over the internet. Uh, there was one bright spot, though, right, Scott? There was. Uh, MPD noted that one segment of the gaming industry rose during the last quarter. Um, and that was non-mobile subscriptions. PlayStation Plus subscribers are up to 47.3 million from 46.3 million at the same point last year, partly due to their uh, their big change, their tiered system they just put out. Uh, but down from the peak of 48 million, million fiscal quarter three 2021, Microsoft didn't update its cloud gaming or Game Pass numbers. Um, it's worth noting that Amazon Luna will be part of Sam uh, Samsung's gaming hub on the 2022 smart TVs that they're doing. But basically to sum it up, People are buying fewer games, spending less time playing them, but there are spending more on these subscriptions. And I don't, as, as, as somebody who's followed this for a long time, I, none of this surprises me. I all. mean, you know, to, to sort of go like, well, this is pandemic, right? This is pandemic, you know, everyone's getting back to real life and people just aren't sitting around playing games on mobile or, you know, on some sort of other screen as much as they were before, right? I think that's part of it. I think part of that is uh, pandemic or not, there was a real uptick during that time. And I think there's some burnout happening. Um, mm -hmm. I hear this a lot of anecdotally anyway from friends and others who cover the business. And there is there is a sense that we've kind of flooded ourselves during that era and actually kind of championed the idea that video games were the great place to land comfortably when things go bad. You know, we can we can turn to them and and have that be our way to deal with uh, trouble, uh, like the pandemic, for example. And while I think that that's true, I think too much of anything is is probably you know needs a little bit of a of a break. However, I don't think any of this is any sort of doom and gloom uh, on any of these fronts, including mobile. I'm a little surprised by those numbers, but on the whole, I think we were headed toward a slowdown. It's just a matter of when. Uh, we're already at a slowdown right now with new games coming out. There's been a million delays as a result of the lockdown and its effect on development. And we're still not seeing some of those games come out yet. Many of those have been pushed to next year and beyond. So there's a drought there as well. Um, and I'm a little surprised none of them brought that up as much because it is the summer is always this way um, a little bit. No, this, they did. The they did. We, we didn't write it in our, our article, but but Sony actually did say, you know, we didn't have a lot of big titles out. Microsoft said nah, some of our better, bigger titles are coming out later this year. So that yeah. that's certainly a part of what they're saying as well. Yeah. And they still have till, you know, they have till November to, to prove out whether what they do, what they still have to come out will will change any of this. But having been around since the big video game arcade crash of. 20 or sorry 1985 when i was 14 years old um <laughs> and my dad owned arcades and watch i watched that just wreck your his, dad his, his owned arcades else. oh yeah i should say oh, i didn't know this it okay. was 84 85 where everything went to crap but the point is uh i remember many 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 talking heads then saying well that's it the fad's over nobody cares about these anymore and they couldn't have been more wrong in fact they were wrong very quickly with the advent of the nes and other home console stuff and con uh, arcades made a comeback as well in the 90s and like a lot of this stuff is cyclical, hard to predict maybe, but I don't think we're anywhere near slowing down. The industry itself is gigantic. It still surpasses that of music and television and film uh, in very substantial, large uh, dollar sign ways. And uh, we may see, you know, I don't want to call it a recession. You're going to see a little bit of pullback, but I don't think it's going to last very long. And when we get kind of caught up with both, we kind of have two things going on. Development got slowed down by the pandemic and supply chain got slowed down by the pandemic famously. And we talk about it here on that show or on the show all the time. Those two things have contributed to a weird desert period. And we're, I just think we're yeah. in that and they have to report the numbers as they see them. So what, what year was that arcade uh, fallout? 84, 85 was when, mm, when it okay. really took okay. a big dive and it was 85. Were there recessions back in the eighties? There were. <laughs> I wonder if that has anything to do with it. It might. I mean, sometimes uh, which is why subscriptions would be doing okay because people are like, I still want to play games. I just can't spend on games like I right. used to. So let right. me save some money and just get access to games on a continuing basis. I can budget for that. I know exactly how much I'm going to spend. I think that makes sense. I'm glad you brought that up because, and, and I don't want to spend much more time on this, but just a quick note about subscriptions. I think we are finally hitting a little bit of the rubber and road 
on the future of subscriptions. I think Microsoft's Game Pass has made their case, and it's a strong one. And I think Sony's revamped tier system for Plus is also making that case for their customers. And we're already seeing that case made on lots of other fronts on PC and otherwise. I think that this might be the time where we look back and go, oh, that's when subs really locked in as the preferred method moving forward. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, uh, moving on from games to uh, the world of the beautiful game. If you're not familiar, <laughs> Dan Compos from NTX is going to tell you all about it and how you can watch it online going forward. Hello, DTNS crew. I come with some news about the sports streaming wars taking place down the border. Last Sunday, folks were happily watching the live stream of the Leon versus America soccer match on the Marca Claro YouTube channel. Claro Sport shares broadcast rights with Fox Sports for the Leon and the Pachuca games. However, Fox Sports sent a takedown notice in the middle of the game. The director of Strategic Alliances and Content for Claro's parent company, America Mobile, Arturo Elias Ayub, posted on Twitter that Claro has a valid license for the transmissions and commercial exploitation of the Leon matches through the internet, including the Claro platform and YouTube channel. Fox Sports responded that the contracts specified that these games cannot be broadcast for free. However, Claro streams on the Claro Sports and Marca Claro were not interrupted, only on YouTube. Marca Claro and Claro Sports are considering taking legal action against Fox Sports. For this and more news, listen to Noticias de Tecnología Express, where we know that soccer is a real football. Back to you, amigos. And uh, you can get Spanish language tech news from Dan on the regular. Just subscribe to Noticias de Tecnología Express at dailytechnewsshow.com slash NTX. Well, Internet Explorer lives, my friends. You might say, but no, no that's, please don't. <laughs> that's, that's impossible. Didn't Microsoft prevent anyone from using Internet Explorer in Windows 11? Yes, but thanks to Twitter user Xeno Panther, who broke Internet Explorer's chains and set it free to run freely on Windows 11, we're in a new world, people, if you want it. Microsoft disabled IE in Windows 11. That was official. That's what the company did, making it the first version of Windows without IE for more than 20 years. Even if you try to launch IE in Windows 11, the OS forces you to use Microsoft Edge. That's their, you know, next-gen browser. But if you search for internet options in the start menu, then you launch the control panel applet, then you select the programs tab, then you hit the manage add-ons area, then you click on learn more about toolbars and extensions, you can still launch Internet Explorer and bypass the commands that force you into Edge. Way uh, to go, Xeno. Xeno Panther, mad respect for your investigative skills, uh, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, but who said now you can't say there aren't such thing as zombies? I believe him. <laughs> Zombie, spelled Z O M B I E. I E. <laughs> I feel like this is the sort of thing like Xeno Panther should get like a bug bounty for. Like, hey, I'm able to do this. And Microsoft being like, oh, no, 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 we don't want people to do that. Uh, let's give you some money. Yeah, so this isn't a bug. This is a thing they left in on purpose for certain situations. Uh, yeah. Right? Because this isn't even a hack. This is just a like, hey, if you click here and click there, you can still find it. So I don't know. Uh, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, let's do it. This one comes from Marlon. Uh, Marlon says, per your discussion about phones and replacing batteries on yesterday's show, I don't know why this phone is being ignored by everyone in the tech media, but I've been using the Samsung X Cover Pro and I love it. It has a swappable battery, a micro SD card slot, costs less than $500 and is tough. Flew off the top of my car, landed face down on a highway on ramp, and the screen is in perfect condition. I mean, kudos to you, Marlon. Uh, Marlon says, I've hung on to phones with swappable batteries ever since the notes. Sad that they don't have them anymore, but things got fairly sketchy for a while. To keep a phone with a swappable battery, the LG V20 wasn't the best choice I ever made, but this phone has been a godsend. Yeah, so I uh, did a little search around, and uh, at least uh, my cursory search of a few reviews, Android Authority seems to be representative. Uh, the X-Cover Pro doesn't get a lot of coverage because it's not considered to be very good in its class. 
Uh, it's not bad. It's not. It's not considered to be bad either. It's just considered to have a little bit of an underpowered processor, a uh, little laggy on things, and that there are other durable, rugged phones out there that have better performance and at least as good a battery life and the swappable and rugged and all of that. So that would be why you probably don't hear about it as much, Marlon. But nice to hear from somebody who actually has been using it and living with it saying like hey works great for me uh it even you know survived the on-ramp that's amazing 100 <laughs> percent. yeah i mean if it works for you then it works uh well thank you to marlon and thank you to everybody who writes in with your feedback on things we talk about on the show keep that feedback coming always makes future shows better feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails and thank you to scott johnson as always for being with us today scott what's going on i love being on and uh, especially when my monitor goes blank and i don't know why it did i think i have a loose cable anyway uh, you can also see me and that's all that matters. Here's the deal. Uh, I do a bunch of shows on my network, but the one I want to point to uh, in particular is one that will really tie into what we talked about today with subscription services and where gaming's headed. That's right. The show is called Core. It's over at frogpants.com. You'll find it and other shows. There's something there for everybody. So go to frogpants.com and check it out and let me know what you think of it all. Again, that's frogpants. Dot com. Well, we're always happy to have Frog Pants himself here on the show. We're also happy to welcome a couple of brand new bosses. We got Charles and we got Paolo. Both just started yeah. backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Paolo. You know, yesterday we said it could be you. And today, Charles and Paolo took us up on that. And we're like, yeah, yeah. it's us. So it tomorrow is. could yeah. be you. <laughs> yeah. It's good stuff. Uh, patrons, you know who you are. Stick around for the extended show. Good day. Internet rolls in right after we finish up DTNS. But just a reminder, you can catch DTNS live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 honey, 20 hundred UTC. And find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. First time in three weeks. This Yay. show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>